Hey everyone, and um, welcome back to another lecture with Dr. Hefner. So, for those of you who were in lecture earlier this morning, there was something wrong with the audio. So I have to I had to re-record this lecture. So you got the unique experience of getting it live, and now I'm going to do it again with no audience. So hopefully this won't be a trend. Um, and Thursday, I'll get it together. But as you all know, this is not the 19th. It is actually March. Oops, I'm about to write the 25th. It's the 24th. It's almost the 25th if you knew how late it was. So we're going to start Chapter 7 today. We're going to talk about chemical reactions. We're going to talk about how we can write chemical um, reactions as equations, write them as words classify them. Then the next time, we're going to balance equations, which we're going to pretty much take a whole entire lecture to do that. That's looking ahead. Let's look at where we are right now. We're going to start by refreshing chemical versus physical changes. So we talked about this maybe chapter five, um, where we talked, or it was either three or five. I can't remember. But we talked about chemical and physical changes. A physical change, the chemical composition doesn't change. So if you have water and you boil it, that's not a chemical change. You still have water. There's no difference. It's just hotter than it was. If you have water and you freeze it, same thing. It's just colder. There's no actual difference in the water itself. If you have a chemical change, however, the substance itself is changed. There's a chemical reaction. So you form a new substance. There's four different pieces of evidence that we can use to say that a chemical reaction has taken place or is taking place. The first is that a gas is produced. So if you've ever seen those baking soda vinegar um, volcanoes and you mix the two, maybe you add a little bit of soap, like detergent, just to enhance the effect, you're seeing a gas be formed. And that gas production is evidence that a reaction is taking place between the baking soda and the vinegar. So our first piece of evidence is a gas being produced. Now, keep in mind that you're not going to observe all of these observations for every single chemical reaction, but you're going to see at least one of them. The second piece of evidence that you can look for is the formation of an insoluble solid. So let's say that you take solution A and solution B. You mix them together and you make a solid. That is evidence of a chemical reaction. It's also called a precipitate, so that solid that's being formed. And in this picture, you can see this kind of yellowish stuff. That's the precipitate. The third piece of evidence you can look for is a permanent color change. Whoa, we just skipped ahead. Come on, Blackboard, get it together. Okay, like I was saying, a permanent color change. So if you take two solutions and you mix them together and you go from having two clear solutions to now a pretty blue or a purple, that indicates that you've made something new. So you've got a new substance that's been formed. The final piece of evidence that suggests a chemical reaction has occurred or is taking place is a change in energy. So if you have a reaction going on in a beaker and the beaker gets hot, that's releasing heat. That's called an exothermic reaction. So exo, think outward or out, and therm, think heat. So heat is moving out of the reaction. The beaker is going to get hot.
The opposite of that is an endothermic reaction. And that's when a reaction absorbs heat. So endo, think in, and then thermic, heat. So you're bringing heat into the reaction. Your beaker gets cold. So those are the four um, pieces of evidence that you can use to support your hypothesis that a chemical reaction is taking place. Now, in the live class, we did kind of like a game show thing, chemical reaction or null. Since I don't have an audience, I mean, I have people in my house, but I don't think they really want to play, I will have to give you the answers. <laughs> so the first one I actually spilled the beans on earlier, but it's one of the best um, formation of bubble um, examples that I can give. And that's the baking soda and vinegar volcano. So if you're forming bubbles or gas, yes, it's a chemical reaction. For number two, you're cooling carbon dioxide and you're making dry ice. Well, dry ice is another way of saying solid carbon dioxide. So no, or no, okay, not a chemical reaction. This is a physical change. For number three, you're combining two liquids and you form a green precipitate. So we're forming something new here. That means yes, there absolutely is a chemical reaction. You've made something new, and it's now solid and green. So be able to go through examples like this and say whether or not a chemical reaction is taking place or not. Now we're moving on to writing chemical equations. So what we have here is a real chemical equation, and there's a lot of information here. We'll start off with the basics. You have reactants on the left-hand side. You have a, an arrow here that means yields or produces. And then you have, ooh, that S did not form. Then you have your product side. And that's always on the right-hand side of the arrow. you'll see these plus signs, and that means they're just used to separate the different compounds. So you'll see those on both sides, the reactive side and the product side. Then we see these letters in parentheses after each of these compounds. Those tell us the states of matter. We'll go through those. AQ, you've already seen from chapter six. We're talking about acids are aqueous, which means they're dissolved in water. Then we have the S, that means a solid. We have the cursive L, or kind of the italicized L, that's a liquid. And finally, we have the G, that stands for gas. So with each of these chemical equations and each of the compounds, you're going to see a compound followed by the state of matter, because it's really important to know whether or not you're using solid or a liquid or a gas, if something's dissolved in water, that means a whole lot for the chemical reaction that you're trying to describe. 
there are some other symbols that we didn't cover that I'm going to point out here. So we did not cover this symbol here where there's a triangle, and I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger. So this triangle means heat. So heat is added to the reaction. You need to heat the reactants in order for the reaction to occur. You can also have an element written over top of that yield arrow, and that means that it's a catalyst. The catalyst just enhances the rate of the reaction, but it doesn't actually get consumed. So we'll call this a reaction enhancer. There are times when you mix things together, nothing happens. For that, you'll see NR or no reaction. So those are the three that we did not cover with our example, but you will see them um, throughout chapter seven and for the rest of our time together. So let's look at this same chemical reaction. We looked at it for all the components, the states of matter, um, you know, there's all these different compounds, the yields or produces arrow. We need to be able to read and write chemical reactions. What that means is you have to be able to name each compound that you see in this reaction. That was covered in Chapter 6. So if you're struggling with Chapter 6 with naming, you really need to practice. There's a lot of practice posted on Blackboard for how to name and how to write chemical formulas from names. <coughs> Excuse me. So you need to get on that. And if you need help, I'm happy to help you. The structure for the written or verbal statement is you talk about the state of matter and then the reactant. State of matter, reactant, for however number of reactants you have. So in this one, we've only got two reactants, so you're going to talk about the state of matter of the first one, then name it. State of matter, name it. Then you're going to say something like they're combined to yield or mixed to produce, some kind of verb that lets you know that these things are added together. Or maybe they're decomposed, but something to show that a reaction is taking place. Then you list the products. So state of matter, product one, state of matter, product two, all of those things, and you write and in between. So when you do that for this reaction, you name everything. I'll number these so you can follow it along. So aqueous acetic acid, which acetic acid already implies that it's aqueous, but just to be on the safe side, Include it because it's good practice. You don't want to forget to include your state of matter. So aqueous acetic acid and solid sodium bicarbonate, that's your second reactant. And I want to highlight, again, that we're looking at states of matter here. Then we have our yield sign, and we're going to write our combined to yield or something like that. So that's the yield sign. Then we have this third compound, which is our first product, aqueous sodium acetate. Note, aqueous there, aqueous here. We have liquid water, we'll name that number four. And yes, liquid water, you're writing liquid to denote that it's a liquid. And finally, carbon dioxide, that's our fifth compound, the third product, and it's a gas, and we state that it's a gas. So practice naming, it is very important for being able to read a chemical reaction. 
So eventually you'll be able to look at this and read it off like you would read a line in a textbook or a novel. So make sure that you practice. That's the only way that you can get good at this. Here's another practice problem. So in class, I had everyone name this first compound. I'm going to go through and name them all for you. I'm going to number them one, two, and three so that I can write them off to the side. Number one, we know that we have metal, and then we have a polyatomic anion here. I'm going to abbreviate that P, P -O -A, no, P -A -A, polyatomic anion. That means that we have some kind of a ternary ionic compound. So we're going to name the metal first, then we're going to name the polyatomic anion. Aluminum is not a transition metal, so we just write aluminum. Then we name the polyatomic anion. If you look at your sheet, you'll find that it is carbonate. So the name of that first compound is aluminum carbonate. The second compound, again, we're looking at something that's ionic. We have a metal plus a nonmetal. This time, it's a binary ionic compound. We're still going to use a similar naming scheme. It's aluminum. You name the cation first, the metal. Then we name the anion. Take the first syllable of oxygen, which is our anion and you add I, D, E. For the third compound, this is a binary molecular compound because there's two nonmetals. So we're going to name the first element and we're going to use a prefix if we have more than one. We don't have more than one, so we're just going to write the name of the element, which is carbon. Then we have two oxygens. We have to use a prefix for two which is di. Then we have to take the first syllable of oxygen, which is ox, and add I, D, E. So now that we've named all of our substances, we can go ahead and write it all out. Now I've named them up here, so instead of writing out the whole entire name again, I'm just going to sub in the numbers. So. Our first compound, aluminum carbonate, solid. I'm going to use a new word here, decomposes. And you'll understand what a decomposition reaction is a little bit later on. But when you see one reactant yielding many products, that's a decomposition reaction. So aluminum carbonate, solid decomposes to yield our number two compound, which is aluminum oxide solid. And carbon dioxide, which is number three, gas. So that's how you do it. You always make sure that you have your compound names and your states of matter. If you don't have the states of matter, it is incomplete. You need all the details in every single aspect of the chemical reaction because you need the detail to know what's going on. So let's move on. We went from the chemical equation to a written description. Now we need to do the reverse. We're going to go from the written description to the chemical equation. Again, you need to know chapter six. If you can't look at a chemical, um, a compound name and write the chemical formula, then you're not going to be able to take a written description of a chemical reaction and write an equation. So let's go through and we're going to separate out our products from 
are reactants. So solid magnesium metal and oxygen gas are combined. Whoop. Stop there. These must be our reactants. They're combined and heated, so we have to keep that in mind when we're writing our chemical equation. To yield, now we're getting to the product, magnesium oxide. So now we need to write out what each of these names are as chemical formulas. Solid magnesium metal, you just write the symbol for magnesium, and then the symbol for a solid, which is an S in parentheses. Done. The and, you're going to write as a plus sign. Now we have to write oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is one of the diatomic uh, molecular gases. It's always in a pair. You're always going to have O2 for your gas. Then we have the are combined and heated to yield. All of that is our arrow. And the heat, we're going to put the triangle above the arrow. Now we need to write a chemical formula for magnesium oxide. Magnesium is a metal. We know that. The ox is from oxygen. And this IDE means that it's an anion. So we have some kind of an ionic compound. Because there's only one metal and one nonmetal, this is a binary ionic compound. So we know that we're going to have magnesium and oxygen, but we need to see whether or not this formula is actually balanced. The magnesium is one of the group 2A metals, which means its charge when it's an ion is going to be plus 2. Oxygen, on the other hand, is a group 6A nonmetal. And to find the charge of that when it's an anion, we take the group number, which is 6, subtract 8, and that gives us negative 2. So it looks like this formula is already balanced for us. All we have to do is add our S to say that it's a solid. This is our answer. So you're taking a mini paragraph and changing it to one line of text. Practice, practice, practice. Here's another one. So we have cadmium metal with aqueous cobalt 2 nitrate, and that should say mixed with. We'll do a little bit of editing here. Produces aqueous cadmium nitrate and cobalt metal. So let's do the same thing where we separate our reactants and our products. So cadmium metal with aqueous mixed with aqueous cobalt to nitrate to produce. So we stop right before the to produce or yield whatever transition to the to the to the products. So these are our reactants. We always list the reactants first. Now if we continue reading, produces aqueous cadmium nitrate and cobalt metal. These are going to be our products. Now we need to convert the words and the chemical names to symbols. Cadmium metal, you just write the symbol for cadmium, which is CD, 
And metal implies that it's a solid. It's mixed with something. That's a cue to write a plus sign. Now we have this aqueous cobalt-2 nitrate. Cobalt-2, we see this Roman numerals. Automatically think, hey, this is a transition metal. It's telling me what the charge is. So I've got this cobalt. Its charge is 2 plus. Don't even have to look at the periodic table. The charge is right there in the name. Nitrate, however, you may need to look up. That you're going to find on your polyatomic anion sheet. So you need to recognize those names and know, oh, this is an ion, this is a polyatomic ion. I need to check my sheet to see what the chemical formula is and the charge. So the cobalt we know is two plus. If you look up nitrate, it's one minus. This is not balanced. So like we did with chapter six, the charge on the cobalt becomes the subscript for the nitrate. And the charge, just the number, becomes the subscript, sub, whew, subscript for the cobalt. I am stumbling over that word, subscript. We don't have to write the one because it's implied. Now we need to add AQ after this to show that it's aqueous. Then we get to the produces part, which means you're drawing an arrow. Now we have to write out a formula for aqueous cadmium nitrate. Now cadmium, it doesn't have a Roman numeral after it, but it is a transition metal. So that means it must be an exception. It only forms one ion. Cadmium only forms a two plus ion. It's the same charge as the cobalt ion, which means that it's going to look very similar to cobalt nitrate, cobalt two nitrate. We're gonna have to add the two here as the subscript. Then you write aqueous, and then you move on to your final product, which is cobalt metal. You write the symbol for cobalt, the symbol for solid because metals are solid. And that's your answer. You take that whole paragraph and translate it into one line. Don't forget that when you're writing these, um, these chemical formulas from the names, that sometimes you will have to balance the charge to make sure you have the right number of cations and anions. So don't skip that step. So we've talked about how to write and read um, chemical reactions and equations. Now we have to be able to classify them. There are five different categories that we're going to cover. I'm not going to read them off in the list. We're just going to go through them one by one, and we're going to add some other tidbits of information along the way. We're going to start with combination reactions. Combination reaction, it's what it implies. You're combining simpler, comp um, simpler compounds to create something more complex. They're also called synthesis reactions. So what they'll look like is A plus B goes to C, where you have multiple reactants one product. So you're taking multiple reactants and synthesizing one very complex compound. Metals with oxygen, they form oxides. That's an example of a combination reaction. You're taking two simple elements. You've got your magnesium, You've got oxygen gas, you're heating it, and you're forming magnesium oxide. 
There are lots of examples of combination reactions. I'm not going to go through all of them. Just know that there are examples that you can reference if you need to. So nonmetals with oxygen, metals and nonmetals to make an ionic compound. These are many examples of different combination reactions that you may see. A decomposition reaction is the reverse. You're taking a single complex compound and you're breaking it down into two or more simpler substances. Oftentimes you need heat to accomplish this, but it's not necessarily a requirement. So what that looks like is you're starting off with A. Sometimes you have heat, we'll put it in parentheses, and you're making B, C, and D. So you have one reactant multiple products. And again, this is the opposite of combination reaction. So if you don't want to have a whole lot to memorize, just remember one of these, either decomposition or combination, and then know that the other is the reverse. So that's a trick to cut down on the number of things that you have to cold memorize. Here are a couple of examples. You can heat solid mercury-2 oxide to make mercury metal and gas. You're starting with something much more complex and you're making multiple products. Same thing with calcium carbonate. You can heat it and create calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. So here's some practice. Um, what you can do is you can pause at this slide if you want more practice, or if you were in class, you can kind of rewrite your notes and figure out which one of these is a synthesis reaction or combination reaction and which one is a decomposition. This first one, we have multiple reactants one product. That sounds like a combination reaction to me. I abbreviate reaction RxN sometimes. The second one, we have one reactant, multiple products. That means that we're going from one complex thing to multiple simple things, and it's a decomposition reaction. So we're going to talk about single replacement reactions, activity series, activity of metals. They're all kind of one big topic. So we're kind of going to introduce both at the same time. When you have a metal in a reaction and it replaces another metal in a solution or a compound, that's called single replacement. The metal that displaces the other metal is more active, hence the name activity series. The activity of a metal is based on its ability to compete in a replacement reaction. So can metal A replace metal B? Yes, okay, great. Can metal A replace metal C? No, it can't. So that means metal C is more active than A. So C is the most reactive, followed by A, followed by B. 
that's the kind of activity series that you're going to have access to. This is what you're going to see in an exam or quiz setting, the relative activity series. The very first one is lithium. This is the most active metal. Always, it will always replace any other metal that it's in a, in a single replacement reaction with. And then as you go along, potassium is a little less active than lithium. Barium, a little less active still. Go all the way down the line until you get to gold. Gold is the least active metal. It's always replaced by everything else. So this is just a long series of activity. Don't think of it as three separate ones, but think of it as you could have all of these on one line, it would be really long, and it would tell you that lithium is most active, followed by potassium, barium, and so on. So we need this information when we're looking at single replacement reactions, because we need to figure out whether or not a metal can displace another metal or not. So in a single replacement reaction, you have one metal that's more active, and it displaces a metal in a compound that is less active. So in this case, the two metals that we're concerned with are iron and copper. When you see the solid metal, that's the one in question. How active is iron in reference To copper. Since there is a reaction and you get iron replacing the copper, that must mean that iron is more active than copper. It comes earlier in the activity series. You can also have metals replacing hydrogen. Hydrogen, we don't really think about it as a metal, but when we have metals mixed with acid, sometimes that metal can replace the hydrogen. So hydrogen is a part of that activity series. And again, we have iron solid, and then we have hydrochloric acid. This hydrogen, the one that I just circled, we want to know is that iron more active or less active than the hydrogen? Since we actually have a reaction here and we're forming hydrogen gas, that must mean that iron is more active than hydrogen. If a metal is less active, then you're going to see no reaction. Remember that from the table of all the different symbols you see in chemical equations. So gold, we said, is the least active metal. It isn't replacing a doggone thing. Gold said, look, I'm already popular. Why do I have to kick somebody else out? You know who I am. So I'm just going to stay here. I'm going to be gold. You can be you. So there's no reaction. So here's a couple of examples that we're going to go through. The first one, will solid silver react with aqueous copper 2 nitrate? 
Well, let's do some writing to see what this means. So solid silver looks like that. And if we're trying to write some kind of a chemical equation, we're going to say plus and then copper 2 nitrate. Trust me on this one. Looks like that, and it's aqueous. And the question is, what are we going to form? Is silver more active than copper? So you go to your activity series, you find silver, you find copper. And it looks like copper comes before the silver. So copper is more active than silver. So that means no reaction. That silver cannot replace the copper in the copper 2 nitrate. Another way that you'll see this is you'll have a chemical equation and then you have to fill in what the, uh, what the products are, either no reaction or there's going to be some kind of a single replacement. So now we're going to compare zinc and lead. So we find zinc. Here it is. Then we find lead. Uh-oh. It's down on that third, that third row. So that means zinc will replace lead. So we swap the zinc in for where the lead is. So you say zinc nitrate. and you're going to form solid lead. When it comes to writing out these new compounds and their chemical formulas, you have to be comfortable with chapter six. So I've been doing this for years. That's why I can look at something and I can just read it like I'm reading the instructions, you know, like words. If you practice, you will be able to do it that well too. It simply takes time. So don't feel bad if it takes you longer to do it. Um, sometimes, you know, you compare yourself to other people, and that's just not helpful. Compare yourself to how good or bad you were the day before or the hour before or the 10 minutes before. That's the only comparison that means anything. Okay, enough of the self-help talk, right? But seriously, I want you guys to do well, okay? Let's look at this second one. Now we're looking at, again, lead and zinc, only this time we're asking, will the lead replace the zinc? We already know that lead is less active than zinc. If it's less active, it's not going to replace a doggone thing. So you write NR for no reaction. Problem solved. Now this last part about activity, I'm not going to test you on what metals can do this, but some metals are so active that they can replace and react the hydrogen in water. Now if you've ever seen maybe in a high school chemistry class where they take a very small slice of sodium metal and drop it into some water and then you see it's like, you know, skipping and jumping all over the place and making a bunch of bubbles, that solid sodium is interacting with the water. And what you're seeing, all those bubbles, that's hydrogen gas. The metals that can do this are group 1A and 2A metals. They are very, very active and they can replace the hydrogen in water. If you're bored and you've already watched everything on YouTube, you can actually find um, examples of this. You can find people doing this little demo. If you want something different to watch, if you want to waste three minutes of your life, you can watch some chemistry. I won't be offended if you don't. 
we've got two more reaction types. We've got double replacement reactions. So in the single replacement, we're swapping in one thing. In a double replacement, you're swapping two. So you're starting with two ionic compounds, and they're in aqueous solutions. And those metals will switch anions, kind of like wife swap. I don't know if y'all are even old enough to know that show. I don't think it's still on. It's kind of a silly premise. But there's two families. The, the wives would switch places. So they would be wife and mom to somebody else's husband and kids. I think it's ridiculous. Ain't no paycheck in the world big enough for me to go and deal with somebody else's kids. Anyway. That's what the premise is for this double replacement reaction. I have it here color-coded. The barium and the potassium are the two cations in these two ionic compounds. And they're literally going to swap places. The barium, instead of being with the chloride, is now going to be with the chromate. So let's write this out. That's the chloride ion. This chromate is from your polyatomic ion sheet. So the barium goes from hanging out with the chloride to the chromate. The potassium goes from hanging out with the chromate to hanging out with the chloride. That's the double replacement. If you'll notice, we also have the formation of a solid on the product side. That's the other requirement for a double replacement reaction. You have to produce an insoluble substance. And barium chromate is insoluble. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, so how am I supposed to know that? Well, you're not. Now you are. Solubility rules. There are rules for predicting whether or not ionic compounds are going to be soluble in water or insoluble in water. The first five rules outline what is soluble. So these are generally soluble. Six through 10 are generally insoluble. It's a lot of rules. You will not need to memorize it. I will provide you with the solubility rules for the exam. So don't worry. In a nutshell, if you're group one or you're an ammonium ion and you're paired with some kind of an anion, whether it's a polyatomic anion or it's something from group 7A like a chloride or bromide or something like that, you're going to be soluble. Everything else is suspect. So to simplify all of those 10 rules, group one metals, if you see anything that's got sodium, if it's got lithium, anything like that, or if you see ammonium, which is NH4+, plus, nitrate, which is NO3, and acetate, which I don't know that I can fit it on here, C2H3O2. All of those things, if you see those, it's probably soluble in water. Everything else, questionable. There are exceptions. This is just a, you know, rough, quick, do I think this might be soluble or insoluble? If I'm pretty confident it's soluble, I don't have to look at the solubility rules. But if it's something that lies outside of these different ions, then I need to check the solubility rules because there may be some exceptions. So here is a double replacement reaction, or is it? You'll notice 
that the states of matter are missing here. What we need to do is figure out, based on our solubility rules, whether or not we think these two compounds for the products are soluble or insoluble. The first one is sodium nitrate. So sodium is a group one metal, right? And this is a nitrate. Well, both of those things get the check for solubility. So we're going to guess that that's aqueous. Then we have another group one metal, lithium. And it's with a halide, so it's with a, it's with a chloride ion. But because it's a group one metal, chances are it also is going to be soluble. So there's actually no reaction here. There's nothing different. It's the same ions in solution. We did not form a precipitate. Precipitate does not have an S, but it's late. And I can't spell past about Mm, 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we did a form of precipitate. That means there's no reaction. There's no double replacement here. That's the kind of reasoning you're going to have to be able to do in an exam setting. And again, you'll get the full list of solubility rules, not just the simplified version. The final type of reaction is the neutralization reaction. That's the addition of an acid and a base. The formula for an acid we already know. We're going to have something that's got a hydrogen in front, could be two or three, and it's absolutely going to be aqueous. For the base, we're looking for something that has an OH. Usually there's a metal for the, for the cation. So there's a metal followed by OH. And it's again, this is aqueous here. It doesn't have to be aqueous. The base can be a solid. So if you buy sodium hydroxide, you can actually buy it as a solid, and it comes in these little tabs that get stuck together. They're like little, they look like little pills. They're kind of tacky because they absorb water very, very easily. The other hallmark for a neutralization reaction is that it produces water. So you have an acid plus a base on the reactant side. And you produce water on the product side. You also produce a salt. So think binary ionic compound or ternary ionic compound. That's what a salt is. But the water will help you the most. You see the acid, the base, and the water. So here's some more practice. The first three questions are asking about whether or not the compound is soluble or insoluble in water. And you're going to need those solubility rules to figure those out. Then the, the other question is just asking, what kind of reaction is it, double replacement or neutralization? So let's tackle the solubility rules questions first. First one we have is mercury 2 chloride. Well, I don't see any group 1 metal ions. I don't see acetate. I don't see nitrate. So I am suspicious. When I check for halogens, or the halides, so you'll see that on your um, solubility rule sheet, you'll see that mercury 2 isn't um, one of your exceptions. So this is actually soluble. Silver bromide, it doesn't have any of the group 1 or the nitrates or anything that might make me say, hey, I'm sure this is soluble. So I have to check the rules. When I check them, 
How eyes are generally soluble, but silver is an exception. Likewise, I don't see any of those ions that would give me warm fuzzies to say, hey, this is soluble. I see lead and I see iodide. So I have to check my solubility rule. And when I do, I'll see that lead is another exception for the halides and it is insoluble. So these are kind of like puzzle problems. You need to be able to reason and use your logic to figure out whether or not these compounds are going to be soluble or insoluble in water. And it's best to just practice. You have to practice with your tools. If you just rely on the fact that you'll have the tool, it doesn't mean you'll know how to use it. So practice before the exam, and then you'll be ready. The final question is, is this a double replacement reaction or is it a neutralization? Let's go through, go through and figure out what our reactants are and our products. This first reactant sure looks a lot like an acid. It's aqueous, we've got the hydrogens in front, so this is an acid. Then we have something OH, that looks like a base. We have water on the product side and we have a ternary ionic compound, which is also known as a salt. So you add all those things together, and all your clues point towards a neutralization reaction. That's the kind of reasoning you're going to have to use to figure out what kind of reaction you're looking at. And you will have to classify reactions for the exam. So this is your mini problem set. It's the first one for chapter seven. For whatever reason, the internet does not like my yield sign or my arrow. But if you go onto Blackboard, you will see the PDF and the Word file that contain all of this information. Make sure that you complete each part of the question. The saddest thing in the world is for me to see people do half of the work correctly because it means that you probably could have gotten close to 100 on the assignment if you would have just read the instructions. So please read the instructions. For this first one, you need to write the chemical reaction in words. Don't forget your states of matter. Name every single reactant and product. The second question, you have to take the written description and write the chemical reaction. Don't forget the little details, like putting the states of matter and putting the yield sign. Those are important. Make sure you go over your naming for chapter six. I know that you can just Google this. That's easy, but you can't do that for the exam. So make sure you can actually do this by looking at your notes and understanding what you're doing. The next question asks you to identify the chemical reactions um, in question one and question two. So is it decomposition? Is it a combination? Double replacement? What reactions are you seeing in one and two? The final question asks you to write the chemical formula for barium sulfate. Then you have to write whether or not this compound is soluble in water. So you can write yes or no, you can write soluble or insoluble. I don't care, just answer something in, in a way that lets me know you know whether or not it's soluble. So please, please, please answer every part of the question and give it an honest try with your notes versus going to Uncle Google. Google will just tell you whatever it can. Doesn't mean that it's right or that it's applicable to the class. So with that, I'll get off my soapbox. Um, Enjoy. I hope this was helpful. You can always reach out to me via email, office hours. We can set something up. I'm here for you. Okay, that was cheesy. I'm going to go to bed. Bye.